All right, welcome back, everybody. It is Friday afternoon. Actually, welcome. It's Friday afternoon. This is our first time on, on uh, streaming today. So uh, you're with the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee, and we're picking up some a hearing on H308, which is, uh, which is a bill to allow for a card check. Uh, and it's a union bill, and we have a few witnesses to start, um, start our testimony on this bill. And I wanted to um, start with Wendy Koenig from, is it Koenig? Koenig. Koenig, okay, um, uh, from, from UVM and uh, let her go to um, recover from, from her second shot. So Wendy, I'll pass you the microphone and, um, and please welcome. Thank you so much. Good to be with all of you, good to see you. Um, thanks for having me in today. I think you know that normally we would have Jess Krause come in and, and testify on a bill like this, but he is not available. He's uh, unable to be here today, so he's passed the baton to me. So um, I've, I've got some comments, and um, I'll, if you have questions, I'll try to answer them, or if I can't, I'll get back to you. So um, for H308, um, an act relating to authorizing card check elections. We've got four primary areas of concern from the university perspective. One, that the bill eliminates the longstanding and well-recognized right of employees to secret ballot election. Two, that it eliminates the pre-election period that allows employees to engage in a full exchange of ideas and opinions and cast a well-informed ballot. Three, that no re-election requirements for unions are certified through card check. A union does not have to campaign every year to maintain status, uh, nor can employees decertify a union they are unhappy with through a card check process. And four, taking away the employee's rights to secret ballot election is dramatic change that should not be undertaken without a clear identifiable need. Election statistics support the current process works in Vermont and that it already heavily favors the unions. Um, couple of, of comments underneath those. Um, we think that card check can be unreliable as an indicator of union support. Um, people sign union cards for many reasons. They sign because they truly want a union and understand what that means. But they also can sign because that on that particular day, they're upset with their supervisor or upset with the institution. They sign because they think the card can only mean that an election will be held. They sign to get an organizer or fellow employee off their back. They sign because they don't want to be singled out in the face of representatives that other employees have already signed up. They sign because they think they know what they are signing, but sometimes do not. And an employee who is approached one-on-one -on -one by a union organizer might sign a card for many reasons. Um, we think that that there's peer pressure that goes along with this. Um, and if the person signs a card, the union knows it. The union will also know who did not support a drive through card check. The privacy of the ballot box does not exist in a card signing process. By contrast, the secret ballot makes sure that no one can be pressured, be it from union organizers or managers, into casting a vote one way or another. In simple terms, no one will ever know you vote in a secret ballot election. With card checks, people will know. Um, for elimination of the pre-election exchange of ideas and opinions, um, once the VLRB provides notice of an election under the current process, a full and free debate on the issues can take place so that the employees can go into the election with all of the information they need to make an informed choice. Employees can share their experiences, talk to their colleagues. They can ask the union and employer questions and learn as much as they can about the pros and cons of re union representation and of the lack of that. This bill would largely eliminate the benefit of an election period with the full exchange of ideas and opinions. This is a missed opportunity for employees to be informed and engaged before making a decision about whether they wish to be part of a union. The no re-election requirements for unions. A full and free election by secret ballot is particularly important because unions do not stand for re-election. Unlike our political representatives, a union does not have to campaign each year or even every several years to maintain its status as the majority representative of employees. 
Once a union is certified, it is there for a long period of time. That makes the first and often the only election so important. Thus, employees denied a secret ballot election in the first instance would not have a second chance. Moreover, H-308 does not even allow for the reverse. For example, it does not allow for employees to sign cards and decertify the union when a majority sign a petition to that effect. In such a case, the employees would still have to go through the entire election process. We don't think that there is a need for this legislation. The current process has worked well for Vermont's employees and for that matter for unions. Looking for the statistics compiled by the VLRB, there were 75 union elections conducted by the Labor Board between 2009 and 2019. Unions won 63 of those 75 at an 84% success rate. Success rates under the NLRA are about 71%. Some may argue that this new law is necessary because of management coercion and discrimination. These statistics do not support such a conclusion. But even putting aside the numbers, the current law already takes care of any cases of management coercion or discrimination. At no time has UVM been accused of committing unfair labor practices during such elections, nor has it been accused of any objectionable election conduct. Even if this were not the case, the current law has sufficient protections for employees to guard against unlawful or coercive conduct by employers. There is already a method by which employees can be made whole if they prove that they are the victims of coercion or discrimination. That method is the filing of unfair labor practices with the VLRB. The board is fully empowered to rectify any case of discrimination or coercion brought before it. At UVM, there have been seven union elections since 1996, five of which were successful for unions. Turnout for UVM elections has been robust and has followed a full and fair debate on the question of unionization. In the two elections that were not successful at UVM, the lack of success was due to infighting among three different unions trying to organize the same group of employees. That situation actually highlights why a secret ballot election is very important. The State Employees Labor Relations Act is not unique. It functions like most labor acts. It's designed to afford employees the right to decide whether or not they wish to be represented by a union. SIRLA is not designed to force unionization or sneak it in the back door. It is not designed to make it as easy as possible for a union to win. It is designed for the employees set up to ensure that they can decide the kind of environment they wanna work in and to make that choice privately free from pressure on either side. It is hard to imagine um, that this is not an anti-democratic piece of legislation. While this bill does much to help the labor organizations, it does nothing for individual employees. If this bill is supposed to be about helping unions, then by all means, it should be passed. But if it is supposed to be about securing and enhancing employee rights and the freedom to choose, it is misguided. Rather than help employees, this bill eliminates the rights and protections that they have held for decades. That concludes my comments. All right. Thank you, Wendy. Um, please take care of yourself. Um, Thank you. I appreciate it. And if when we have questions for UVM, we'll try to find a time when Jess is available. Um, um, and just so you know, I also uh, submitted something in writing as well. Yeah, saw that. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Um, next up, we have um, Liz Medina from AFL-CIO. Liz, welcome. Thank you. Um, so thank you for having me. My name is Liz Medina. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, which is our state's Federation of Labor Unions and Affiliates, representing over 10,000 working Vermonters. I know you're at least somewhat familiar with the legal details of car check, uh, the car check election process proposed in H308. So therefore, I will focus on why H308 is so important to working Vermonters and US workers in general. I want you all to imagine for a moment that we're living in a country, let's call it Oligalia. Oligalia is a de facto one party state. Let's call this ruling party the National Oligalists. Oligalia has some civil rights, 
but there are no penalties for violations. The National Oligalists have party members in charge of almost every institution and workplace. If an Oligalian citizen expresses support for an opposition party, they can be sure that a National Oligalist party member will disparage and exile them. Opposition party members will find themselves discredited, unemployed, perhaps unable to find another job again. The threat of marginalization and starvation keeps the National Oligalists in power, winning election after election, which is why Oligalia is a de facto one-party state. Now, I want to bring you back to our world, to Vermont. We pride ourselves on being a free, progressive, and certainly modern state. But as soon as we enter the workplace, we are in Oligalia. That is how broken and dysfunctional our state and national labor law is. Throughout this pandemic, our labor council received numerous calls from municipal employees who wanted a union. Because these employees are effectively living in Oligalia, I must share their stories anonymously. One story, however, stands out in particular. In the middle of winter, I received a call from an municipal employee on a road crew. Road crew. One has to be a fairly strong person to handle that kind of physical labor. Nonetheless, this strong, essential worker told me they feared for their family's life because their supervisor was ordering them and their coworkers to all cram into the same work vehicle, despite the severe risk of COVID exposure. They and their coworkers felt powerless to say no on their own. That's why they were calling me. They wanted to know how they could form a union so they could be protected as well as their family and their coworkers. I told them the whole unionizing process from first winning a majority sign up of union cars to winning a VLRB election, at which point their employer would know they were unionizing. The VLRB election process puts workers at great risk and they wanted to know what those risks are. I believe in always telling the truth. So I shared that unfortunately Employers sometimes retaliate against their employees for trying to form a union. In fact, the Economic Policy Institute found that employers were charged with illegally coercing, threatening, or retaliating against workers for supporting a union in nearly a third of all union elections. The reason why retaliation for union support is so prevalent is because there are no penalties. There are no fines for violations. At most, an employer may be required to rehire an employee with back pay if they were unjustly fired for their union support. In an at-will state, they can really make up any reason. Compound this with the rabid anti-union, anti-worker rhetoric in the media. And it's no wonder that union membership is down across the country, including in Vermont, in which only 11% of working Vermonters belong to a union. That essential municipal employee simply couldn't take those risks, especially when so many jobs have been destroyed by the pandemic. They were in an impossible situation in which they are forced to choose between no collective support against COVID-19 or not being able to heat their home and put food on their family's table. In the end, they felt they could not risk losing their ability to support their family, all because our labor law is broken. Amazon workers in Bessemer, Alabama were put in this same impossible situation recently, and the results were absolutely tragic. For those of you who have not been following this drive in the national news, Amazon workers in Bessemer, Alabama are majority women and people of color. They are given inhuman sweatshop productivity quotas for low wages. They are worked so brutally that most can't even find the time to go to the bathroom during their shift. Workers are afraid of being fired for failing to meet their productivity quotas that many of them regularly urinate or even defecate in bottles or bags, which are regularly found throughout the warehouse. These unsanitary practices were so common that they had to be addressed by managers and internal policies by the company. These workers are employed by one of the richest, most powerful men in the world, and they're constantly surveilled and disciplined. Despite this, they courageously teamed up with a union, the RWDSU, and they signed up over 3,000 of their coworkers to join the union. However, 
When they finally were done with the second stage of the process, the NLRB election, only 738 ended up voting yes. Why is that? If you think it's simply because workers changed their minds, you have not been paying attention. Amazon committed unfair labor practice after unfair labor practice without consequence, including hiring supervisors to constantly watch and threaten employees who supported the union, threatening to relocate, and installing their own ballot box to which only they had a key on their work site. Can you imagine if we asked voters to cast their ballots at a single party's headquarters and only that party had the key? Our labor law and these working conditions make a mockery of everything we have always stood for as a nation. Our current labor law results in a huge power imbalance between employers and employees, and it plays out at every level, from the local, municipal, to the national. The fact is that if a worker signs a union card, that is a pretty unequivocal vote for the union. A union <laughs> official does not have power to fire an employee for not signing a union card. An employer does. There is no need to continue following the clearly broken VLRB and NLRB election process. In the public sector, workers who don't want to join a union don't have to, and yet they will still be entitled to enjoy all of the benefits. The Biden administration strongly supports unions and labor law reform to encourage unionization. In a recent public statement in support of the PRO Act, which complements H308, President Joe Biden stated, and I quote, the National Labor Relations Act didn't just say that we should hamstring unions or merely tolerate them. It said that we should encourage unions, encourage unions, end quote. President Biden further stated that, quote, all of us deserve to enjoy America's full promise in full. And our nation's leaders have a responsibility to deliver it. That starts with rebuilding unions. The middle class built this country and unions built the middle class. Unions give workers a stronger voice to increase wages, improve the quality of jobs and protect job security, protect against racial and all other forms of discrimination and sexual harassment and protect workers' health, safety and benefits in the workplace. Unions lift up workers, both union and non-union. They are critical to strengthening our economic competitiveness." End quote. So my question to you today is, are you ready to do your part in leading this country toward economic justice and prosperity? If the answer is yes, then pass H308 before the end of this session. This is an incredible opportunity to lead our nation. Our most cherished leaders have never sat around and waited for national action to protect working people. This was true when it came to the eight hour day, civil unions, and this was true when it came to ending child labor. Unfortunately, we are quickly regressing to those harder, more brutal times. The task before us is to protect workers' rights and as President Biden stated, encourage unions. Please pass card check H308 this session. Thank you. Great, thank you, Liz. Um, next up, we have, um, excuse me, is it Tevia Kelman? That's excellent. Yes, well done. You must have seen Fiddler on the Roof at some point. Uh, yeah, I played in it in high school and, you know, there it's you a go. good name to carry. It, yes, I, I, not always an easy one to pronounce though, so kudos. It has a lot of tradition <laughs> i'm sorry indeed no uh, no but thank you for coming in tevia can you please just let let us know um let us know who you are and 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 share your thoughts on card check please absolutely um yeah so my name is tevia kelman um you can call me tev i'm a lifelong vermonter except for four years i went to college out of state um, I live in the town of Washington and I teach social studies and English at Randolph Union High School, the town I was born in. I'm a proud card carrying member of Vermont NEA. Um, I'm also the vice president of my local association. I'm here, um, I'm grateful and very pleased to be here speaking of full throated support of H308, um, a bill who I believe the passage of which is crucial to Vermont's economic recovery 
from the pandemic and to laying the groundwork for a more just society. Um, I'm here today as a unionized public school teacher and also as the child of unionized public school teachers. Um, and these two facts have helped ensure that my brothers and I grew up in the middle class during a time when that was becoming an endangered species. And it's helped ensure that my own children enjoy a level of financial security and access to, among other things, healthcare that too many of the students I teach don't. Um, in recent years, um, particularly during the pandemic, it's helped my coworkers and I bargain for basic safety protections during the uh, COVID-19 crisis. It's helped make sure we have both adequate time to plan lessons for our students and adequate time to care for our families so we don't have to choose between those things. It's helped us protect staffing levels that are necessary to deliver the education that kids deserve. Um, it's helped us win significant wage increases, especially for our lowest paid workers, over 90% of whom are women in our union. And I'm talking about our educators, the food service workers, the bus drivers, and the custodians who taught, fed, transported, and cleaned for our kids during the pandemic many of whom do not make a living wage. But there's tremendous imbalance between the levels of unionization, the private sector where a majority of Americans work and the public sector where I work. Um, and this has had some really toxic political effects um, because it opens the door for unionized workers to be portrayed as, as the problem, as hoarding wealth in a time of scarcity. And we've seen this premise used repeatedly um, in attempts to pressure our unions to make concessions to austerity, whether that's at the local, state, or national level. Um, so I'm a history teacher, and I think that a little bit of history, historical context is really crucial to understanding why that line of thinking is at best misguided, and I think more accurately, like deceitful and, and spurious, and I think by extension, opposition to, to the card check bill. Um, I think is, is a historical and makes no sense. So when I teach my 11th graders um, about the history of the labor movement, I show them this graph. And um, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to screen share. So sorry for the low tech this. Um, but you can probably see that the line at the top is, uh, is yellow. It represents uh, income inequality, you know, the Gini coefficient. And as you can see on the left side of the graph, the beginning of the century, it's quite high, and that it trends downward toward the middle of the century and then trends back upward, beginning in about the early 1970s and has continued a, a ever steeper climb um, up until the present moment. The bottom, the blue line, um, it's kind of the mirror image, right? It starts low at the origin and, and then climbs up around the middle of the century, right when the income inequality is at its lowest point is when the blue line's apex. And then around the same time in the 1970s, it begins an increasingly steep decline. So that blue line, of course, represents union density, the share of the American workforce that is in a labor union. And um, my 11th graders are pretty quick to notice the strong correlation between low levels of union density and skyrocketing inequality. And by the time I'm done with them, they can explain why, right? Because they've learned about the role of the Knights of Labor and the international workers of the world in laying the groundwork for the reforms of the progressive era, or how the CIO and the strike wave of the early 1930s um, pushed forward the most profound and long lasting uh, reforms of the New Deal. When they understand how crucial unions were in fighting for the eight hour day, women's suffrage, the abolition of child labor, workers' compensation, health and safety laws, fire exits, the minimum wage, protections against workplace harassment and discrimination, the weekend. This correlation makes sense to them. Um, and it's no less true today, right? Research has repeatedly shown that unionization decreases racial and gender pay disparities raises prevailing wages for non-union workers, stimulates economic growth because it increases the share of the population that has disposable income and leisure time. So for me, it's a little hard to grasp how anyone could look at our nation's history and not support a bill that makes it easier for working people to join a union, to band together to protect 
and advance their collective interests. And especially at a time where historic and toxic levels of unequal wealth distribution are connected to all of our worst social problems, racial inequality, political corruption, environmental degradation, the carnage of the COVID-19 pandemic. How could one see removing barriers to union membership as anything but a positive good? Um, a recent Gallup poll showed that nearly two thirds of Americans support the right to unionize, but only 7.1% actually enjoy this right. Why is this? A lot of my students make the connection between the long, slow climb at the left side of that curve of union density and the brutal suppression of workers during the Gilded Age, during the first and second Red Scares, um, and at other times in American history. When they learn about Homestead and the use of strike breakers and Pinkertons firing on striking steel workers, when they learn that the first antitrust legislation, the Sherman Antitrust Act, was used to bust up Gilded Age labor unions instead of the monopolies it was designed to regulate, when they learn about how during the West Virginia Coal Wars, US military air power was used against striking coal miners, when they understand that Martin Luther King was assassinated in the context of a unionization campaign among the Memphis sanitation workers, they begin to grasp the extent to which the wealthy and powerful have fought to prevent workers from joining together to demand better pay, better working conditions, security. And what we always run out of time in American history to cover is what's happened over the past 50 years, right? How that labor movement, so powerful in the middle of the century that had, had managed to, to create a thriving middle class, right? I mean, this is the time that Donald Trump is talking about when he wants to make America great. And uh, the great part was that working people, a greater proportion of them than ever before, because of, of what had happened, um, had, had, had gotten a slice of the working, had gotten a slice of the American dream. Since then, a combination of factors, including McCarthyism, deindustrialization, trickle-down economics, a series of federal, executive, judicial, and legislative actions that have weakened uh, organized labor, and decades of coordinated anti-union propaganda and anti-worker uh, policy prescriptions funded by corporate and right-wing interests. That has brought us to the point we're at today. Um, few of my students, because we run out of time, and unfortunately, I think too few policy policymakers seem to grasp that the attempts to prevent workers from unionizing, while they're perhaps arguably less violent than they were during the Gilded Age, have been nonetheless ruthlessly effective. And it's no accident that the past 50 years of declining union density track almost perfect, uh, perfectly with the period where real wages for workers flatline, while productivity continues to climb and accumulation of wealth by the 1% skyrockets. From what I understand, critics of card check um, tend to argue that the process is coercive and undemocratic. And that's what I was hearing implied earlier. I find that laughable and ahistorical and flat out wrong. Um, the, as, as Liz was, was referring to, um, and as the case of, of Amazon and the failed Bessemer unionization drive is only the latest of so many recent examples, management continues to put tremendous resources into coercive tactics from retaliation to intimidation to propaganda to defeat union elections. It's quite simple. The longer and more onerous the process for securing union recognition, the more time, the bigger the window companies have to target the leaders, to spread misinformation, to threaten potential voters, largely with the protection of federal labor law. We should be extremely skeptical of arguments that invoke democracy to justify barriers to union membership for the exact reasons that we should reject the, the logic behind the anti-democratic new Jim Crow voting laws that we're seeing in the Southern states. Card check is not a tool to pressure people into making a choice they don't wanna make. Unions protect workers' choices. And card check is a tiny tool that we have to wield in an attempt to, to uh, correct a tremendous imbalance of power. It's our slingshot when we go up against Goliath because as Liz was 
beautifully illustrating in, in her little parable there. Um, what's coercive and undemocratic is the American workplace. 74% of American workers are at will employees. And that means they are subject to the arbitrary and absolute directives of their employers. And that arrangement is a recipe for all of the worst kinds of workplace abuse from exploitive contracts, unsafe working conditions, harassment at work, because the boss has absolute leverage. They can, on a whim, take away your paycheck and put you in financial precarity. And this was driven home in an extremely painful and personal way for me recently. When I read an article in VT Digger um, a couple of weeks ago about a federal investigation into a McDonald's um, in Randolph, perhaps some of you read this, um, if you haven't, the article details the disgusting and dehumanizing treatment that employees suffered for years at the hands of a single supervisor and the well-founded fear of retaliation that prevented them from speaking out. And it so happens that that particular McDonald's has employed more of my current and former students than I care to, to try to count. And I can only imagine how many of them um, suffered under this man's grabby hands and his abusive and lecherous tongue. And how many more have, if, if somebody hadn't you know, taken their financial security at, at, at risk um, to, to do something to protect future workers. So passing this bill would mean that those workers would have a chance to organize and protect themselves against a guy like that. So in summary, if you wanna reduce income equality and political division, if you wanna fight sexual harassment, discrimination, racial or gender pay disparity, if you wanna promote democracy and prosperity, you should support this bill. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Tevia. Um, next up is Omar Fernandez. And Omar, just um, give us a little bit of bio and, and, and we'll take your comments. Yes, sir. First of all, I want to um, thank everyone for allowing us to be here. I appreciate the time you've given us. My name is Omar Fernandez. I am the president for the American Postal Workers Union of Vermont. I'm also a, an executive board member of the AFL-CIO of Vermont. And one of the things I want to talk about here is, first of all, what is a union? A lot of people like to think that a union is a bunch of lawyers that you hire and they'll take care of your business. That's not what a union is. A union is a bunch of people that come together to fight for their rights, to fight for the things that they need to live a dignified life. Let's talk about that. What is a dignified life? A dignified life is one in which you can go to work, take care of your family, save some money, and God forbid, even go on vacation. It's something that I haven't been able to do. It's something that I just been able to do because now I work, I work in a place that has a union. Now here's one thing that I wanna say about a union. We gotta stop thinking that a union is separated from the people that they represent. Without the people, the union is absolutely nothing. Without the people backing the, us, backing the president or whomever is representing us, we're nothing. So we gotta stop thinking that Union is some separate entity away from the people. The union is exactly what the people want. And here's one thing I always say, always, this without fail, my greatest organizers at the Postal Service are managers. I wanna say that again, the managers organize our membership a lot better than anything we can do. Why is that? because they do things that just go way too far. They just take it overboard. They do things that are just inhumane. They take away positions and then they expect people to work two and three jobs at the same time. Carriers, in case every single one of you ever wonder why your mail is late, why the line's along at the postal service, it's because of this, it's because Back in the day when there was one carrier sending, putting out your mail, now there's one carrier doing two, three, and four routes. And guess what? We still do it. The guys still get it done. 
You might be a little bit later, but it still gets done. Even though right now our postmaster general is talking about that he wants to make it even further. He wants to say it takes four to five days to get your first class mail out. So we need to support our post office, but let's get on over to a, another part. I always like to say, let us come together on things we can agree upon. And here's one thing that we can agree upon. Everybody should have a job that takes care of their family. One job. You shouldn't have two, three, and four jobs. Everything that we have going on in this world, going on in the United States, can be pointed to poverty. If everyone was paid that dignified wage of 25 to 33 dollars an hour is what everything's saying right now because of production and things like that, people would be living that life that they want to live. And, and, and let me say something weird that you probably won't hear a lot of unionists say. I don't care if you're making a trillion dollars a second. That's awesome. Do that. It's the American dream. But can a guy or a woman that's working 40 hours a week can they, please, can they take care of their family? Is that a possibility? Can we do that? Can that person work eight hours and come home and take care of their family, enjoy their family? Can they come home and be able to save money, be able to take trips, be able to have leisure time? Yeah. Is that a possibility? Every single one of you have power to do that with age 308. Every single one of you. Let's do that right now the wealthy have unions. They don't call them unions, but they call them clubs. They call them associations. They call them assemblies. They call them this, they call them that. They get together and they talk about how we can, how we can make money. What can you do to get that work? They got that. Good, that's fine. I'm cool with that. Can the people have that too? Can we be able to do that to take care of our family? That's all we want. That's all we want. We don't wanna be working the rest of our lives we want to be able to have a proper pension. We want to be able to take care of our family. Now, I'm going to go back real quick so you guys can understand where I come from. I was a minister down in Mexico, three years, loved my job, had to come over here to take care of my family. While I was here, a friend of mine, one of my best friends in Vermont, the gentleman that I helped get his first job in Vermont when he moved over here from Canada, hired me to deliver Staples products for him. Thanks, brother. That's awesome, I appreciate it. Little did I know what was gonna happen. I was working anywhere from 18 to 19 hours a day, no joke, with delivering products all the way from Bridgewater, Vermont, all the way to the other side in Rutland, down of four, I believe it was, or seven, to Bennington and back across over to Brattleboro. Hardest job I've ever had in my life. And my best friend, I would say to him, hey, brother, um, I'm looking at 50 tables right now that I need to get delivered um, to this one address that the gentleman who drives that route says is all the way on the third floor and has no elevator. Now, this gentleman was a 65-year-old man who had no choice but to work because he didn't have a pension. It was taken away from him. So I told, my, my, I told that to my best friend. He was like, oh, he can handle it. There's no big deal. He can do that. My own particular situation, and while I was doing all this delivery and all that, I went to go deliver some bread over in the supermarket. I'm knocking, banging on the door in 20 below weather, hearing people laughing on the other end of the, of the door. I'm frustrated as all get out, as you can imagine, especially after not getting enough sleep the day before. I go in, I say, hey, you know what? I don't have to use the back door. Let me go in through the front. I go in through the front, deliver my bread. All of a sudden, the manager out of nowhere comes yelling at me, hey, you can't. Anyways, what ended up happening is that I ended up getting suspended. I ended up getting all my hours taken away. And, and trust me, these hours weren't very well paid. As a matter of fact, my best friend had to give me a raise so that I can even afford to live where I was living because he wasn't even paying enough. So I say all this to say that I was in a situation where I couldn't get, it, get out. I had just gotten back from Mexico. I had to take this job and I had no choice. 
but I was caught in a situation where I had no representation, where I thought my best friend was going to be able to take care of me. He was the owner of the company and he did not. I ended up getting fired. And that, and that's only because I went over to Massachusetts to take my postal exam. I was caught up in the snowpocalypse that they had there where they shut all the roads down, couldn't travel for a week. And I got fired because they said I did a no show, no call. My best friend did that. Now imagine how it would be with other managers, people that don't even know you, don't even care about you. All they see is the bottom line. So when I started working for the Postal Service and they gave me a chance to represent people and become a steward, I jumped on it. Because here it is finally where I can talk, where I can represent my sisters and brothers to make sure that their rights are always being upheld. And, and I'll tell you this, we've got to come together to take care of us. I need each one of you representatives to pass this H308 to take care of the families of Vermont. And a lot of people like to say, well, get education in order for you to get a higher paying job. Okay, that's good. But what if you're a person that's not good with math or programming or whatever? What if you're a person that likes to sweep? What if you're a person that likes to take, take clean? What's wrong? with doing the job that you like and still be able to take care of your family. What is wrong with that? We need people to clean, clean offices. We need people to, to drive those buses. We need people to work in, those, uh, in that cafeteria. We need people in those jobs. And why is it that when they work those jobs, they can't take care of their family? Why can't they be able to have that dignified life? For the first time in my little 51 years, I've been working for the post office for six years. I can finally take a vacation. Do you know why I can finally take a vacation? Because the union gave that to me. And because my mentality, I had to change my mentality from working all these years in these jobs where there was no way I could even afford going anywhere. So I thank God for my union where I can finally this year, I'm going to be able to take a vacation. So that's going to be all my comments. But ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, we're all human beings. Every single one of us want to take care of our family. Every single one of us help those of us that don't have these good paying jobs get a union so that they can. These companies aren't making enough money to do it. And I tell you, when we do union negotiation, we, we request for information how much the company makes because we don't want the company to go away. We just want to be able for our labor to take care of our family. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time you've given us. Thank you, Omar. Um, so Liz, if we can take a half a step back here, and if you can, um, from, from your perspective, walk us through a card check situation. Um, where I mean, we, when, we, when we did a walkthrough on this, we had a conversation ranging from, oh, well, what if this shop had only three people in it versus um, a place that had, you know, 100 people in it. Um, and also understanding, it, it giving us the context of um, the fact that most of your union members are private sector, but this is, we can only change the law for public sector here. We can't do the national, um, the national move, but we, but you're asking us. This bill is asking us to contemplate changing this on the on in the public sector union. So, can you just take us through the way that you would envision? Um, uh, I don't know if you want to, you know, fictionalize any place or or um, create it, but just if you could create us a situation about what how how it works um, from your organization's level and how you even have to start to become the union of choice for people. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I want to give a personal shout out to Damian Leonard, um, who did an excellent walkthrough of how union elections work um, uh, several weeks ago. Um, and I'm going to simplify that just to make it uh, the illustration clearer. And, um, you know, I also want to just add that in, in the case of uh, the municipal employees um, who called wanting to unionize, um, what's not captured in statistics are all the workers who never petition the VLRB or the NLRB because they're afraid um, because of the prevalence of uh, retaliation. 
So um, I just want everyone to consider that. Um, so say um, this uh, town of, uh, with municipal employees, um, say there's 10 on um, um, a road crew, um, just making up things. <laughs> um, say a few individuals uh, reach out um, either to the Vermont State Labor Council or to um, a local union such as um, ASME or EFT. Uh, we would have a conversation about them, get to know their workplace and um, give them an idea of like, you know, samples of contracts for their, some, their industry, um, address their issues and also consider that and just really do some education about what the union is. And, and as Omar so clearly stated, um, the union is the workers, it, it, is them. We only play an advisory role. Um, we, and we just give them the tools um, and they, they really take it from there. And then it's really up to the, the, those workers to then have conversations with their coworkers. So we wouldn't necessarily go in and be like, oh, you know, sign these union cards and, you know, we really want you to. Um, it would be their coworkers talking to their co other coworkers and we, they would have an organized, what we would call an organizing conversation with their coworkers. And that's really just a conversation about listening and empathy. It's, it's saying, hey, you know, I've been having X issue at this workplace. Um, you know, I'm aware, afraid for COVID and, and going in the same vehicle. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I don't want um, any of us to individually be fired for or, or disciplined for speaking up. So I thought maybe, you know, we should, we should do something about, like, what are your issues? And like, how are, how are things going for you? And they would be doing a lot of listening. And you know, if those workers feel that the union um, unionizing, coming together as a collective as a collective power, is in their interest to address their issue, then they would go about the business of signing the uh, union cards. And so, what a union card is is um, it's a, a form that basically states, um, "I would like to be um, represented by um, X union," um, and uh, you know, we want to be part of the, this union and um, have their guidance and, and support in helping us address our workplace issues. Um, and so any organizer will say, uh, knows that if you want to actually be successful with a VLRB election even, um, that while you can petition to have a VLRB election um, with only 30% of your workers signed union cards, uh, you won't be successful unless you get actually way above that. Two thirds is what we aim for, because that's how intense the um, retaliation and, and propaganda captive audience meetings are for uh, workers when they're trying to organize in their workplace. Um, so we know a lot of uh, workers will unfortunately be made afraid by their employers. So we always, always try to sign, sign up at least a majority and much beyond that. Um, and so those coworkers will um, talk to their, each other, get them to sign up the cards, um, send them back to us. And at that point, um, once we did have the overmajority, we would petition for a VLRB election. What this um, legislation does essentially is take, is remove the fear, the real fear that workers have, that they will be retaliated against and potentially lose their job um, if they go through with the VRB election process, at which point their, their employers will have a lot of time to work on them and um, take coercive action. Um, so this, this, this legislation just takes up out that um, really dangerous extra step, the VLB election, and says, hey, you know, if a majority of workers, if, uh, you know, seven or, or even five at this 10 person workplace sign union cards, that is, a pretty unequivocal vote for the union. Again, the union doesn't, isn't some other external entity, it's the workers and us as union um, officers and staff, we don't have any power over the workers. We can't fire them or anything. We're just, you know, guiding um, supporters. Um, so, you know, there's no real power we have to make them sign a card. Um, and so that, that, that would just be like, hey, they've already signed up, that's a vote let's give them the certification. Um, and, you know, if the workers um, in the public sector, especially, you know, if there's like the three or five workers who don't want to join the union, 
um, because of the Supreme Court's decision, Janus, um, they don't have to. They don't have to join the union. They don't have to pay dues. They can enjoy all the benefits of the union, including representation and support and collective support when they need it and want it. But they don't have to contribute anything. There's no obligation from them. So, you know, there's really no coercive action or, or coercion for the minority of workers who don't necessarily want to belong to the union. Um, there's, it's quite democratic and quite free. Um, and, uh, you know, last I will say, you know, in terms of decertification, um, there is a process for that. And it, and it frankly, you know, should be harder because um, if the majority of your coworkers um, decide to want, they want a union and, wa and want that collective support, um, it shouldn't be a minority of workers, um, you know, being able to just uh, coerce and have a campaign to remove them. Um, so that's, I hope, a satisfactory walkthrough. So you get, you get the, 51% of the votes or the, 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 the employees to sign a card. Um, so that ostensibly cuts out the election process, the weeks and the weeks or months that it could take to have an election. Uh, does, does the employer have to, have to, can they disagree? Like, can they not recognize you? Uh, after being verified and certified by the VLRB? Yeah. Um, I, I don't believe that's uh, the case. I don't think le legally they would have to recognize the union. And, and negotiate, and negotiate, you know, and create a good faith negotiation out of that. Yes. And current mm -hmm. law says to the decertification issue, um, there's like a 12 month like right now in public sector, I believe there's like a 12 month trial. I'm gonna call it a tryout period. I, I'm sure that's not the right phrase, but isn't there a period of time that the, that the union is in place and then it can be, then if the, if, if, the, if the members of that union were unhappy with the way that they were working with that particular union, they could then vote to decertify. Um, previous testimony said that that's not the case and, and I'm, and I'm just not clear on that. And maybe, maybe it'll be a question for legal counsel um, on, on how that works. But um, did I hear that right from, from the previous witness? Um, well, I, 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 I'll defer to Damien um, to have the last word on this, but from what I understand of the uh, legislation, um, you know, the, uh, once, once the union is certified, um, they, they, you can't de decertify um, within the first uh, 12 months. Obviously that would hamper any uh, ability to try to negotiate a first contract if that were the case. Um, there needs to be some kind of stabilization within at least the first year. Um, and then afterward, um, through a um, VLRB election process, um, which is not a car check election, uh, if the workers were, majority of workers were dissatisfied, they could have a VLRB election to decertify the union. Right, and there's set percentages that would, just like just like it takes thirty percent to have an election, it would still have. There's some number there that says so many people have to say, "I want to have a decertification election." Yes, That's I'm not. The, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead Damien. <laughs> I, I was just going to say it's it's the same number have to submit a petition to the VLRB, and then the VLRB holds an election where essentially is the question is. Uh, should this bargaining unit no longer be represented? Um, and um, Tim Noonan is probably a great resource to walk the committee through how often that occurs and so forth. But there is that sort of protection for the initial period because uh, what you don't necessarily want to have is a situation where, for example, maybe there are two competing unions or negotiations take a long time and there's a another union drive occurring while the, the first contract is being negotiated because that provides, um, it basically provides an unsettled environment for both labor and the employer because the employer doesn't know who they're supposed to be negotiating with. And labor um, doesn't have a chance to see how the first union's performing um, because often it takes time to negotiate a contract and there might be sticking points um, as we've seen with 
you know, state employee contracts that have taken a year to negotiate and that sort of thing. So, um, but let me let Liz keep talking here. I don't want to cut into your time. No, that's, that's, you said it beautifully. Thank you, Damien. <laughs> we have some questions lined up, Representative Murphy, then Parsons. Thank you, Chair Stevens. I'm uh, one of the newer members to the committee, so I have some questions that probably other people already know answers to. But I am curious, when you spoke of um, the, once the VLRB is certified the, the union, it, um, it, it's in place that, that it, the, the employer has to recognize it. The question was, does the, does the employer have to recognize the union? And, and it was that once it's been recognized, it does. So my question is, what's the process for the VLRB to recognize the union after the card check? I, I guess I understand if there's a, a vote, but after the card check, I'm just curious what that process is. Um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Damien, but I believe um, the cards have to be verified by a third party to ensure that all the employees are eligible to be in what we would call the bargaining unit. Um, the bargaining unit consists of non-supervisory and non-confidential employees, um, and the VLRB would be um, involved in helping to determine that as well. Um, if a third party isn't available to verify um, those cards, uh, the VLRB would do that, I believe. Yeah, so it's, it actually depends um, on which Labor Relations Act we're talking about. So the process for um, uh, teachers and school administrators is the impartial third party um, that the parties agree on. And if they can't agree on, the impar on an impartial third party, it goes to the Labor Board. For the state employees and municipal employees, um, it would go just straight to the labor board and that either third party or the board basically reviews the petition to give you uh, uh, an impartial determination of whether uh, there are enough, um, uh, enough signatures um, and their valid signatures, et cetera, to uh, certify the union. Um, and it's basically with the board, it's part of the petition process. So you submit the petition and the board is going to determine, uh, do you have more than 30%, which is the threshold for an election? And then beyond that, do you have more than 50%, which would be the threshold for card check certification? If you don't have more than 50%, then the, but you do have more than 30, the board would send it to an election. But if you do have more than 50%, they would certify the union. Uh, for that bargaining unit. And the board also makes the determination of the appropriate bargaining unit. So for example, if there is a question about, um, I think this was in the news, I think today or yesterday, uh, there's a bargaining unit at UVM right now that's working on organizing and there's dispute about uh, between the uh, union organizers and the university about whether certain employees are confidential employees or not, mm -hmm. that's something that the board resolves. So for example, uh, the board might say, you know, these 10 employees are actually confidential employees, which means they have too much exposure to um, confidential employer information regarding the employee-employer relationship. So they can't be part of the union because they would have a conflict of interest. Um, and so it would take them out and then count the remaining signatures on the petition um, versus the remaining number of people in the bargaining unit. Thank you. And, and Damien did use language that helps me understand it with speaking of it as petition, because I keep thinking about cards and do you put your card in a box or, you know, so, so certainly petitions, any of us that got elected to an office get, you got to get a certain number of names on it and your petitions check to see if those people are valid voters. So thank you. That does make it very comprehensible. Yeah. Card, card check is a very old fashioned term from uh, the early days of collective bargaining in this country. So it just happens to have stuck around. And, and Damien, just to be clear on the determination of the bargaining unit. So in a group in, 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 in any particular group that's seeking to do it, perhaps through card check, I mean, they have to go 
to the VLRB to get a determination of what the bargaining, I mean, there might be 50 people who are interested in joining a union and VLRB could turn around and say, whoa, only 30 of you fit in this particular bargaining unit. And then it's, it could be broken down otherwise. So they, in order to, in order to get to the point of even collecting signatures, people have to ask where, where would we go? Yeah, so it, it is something that the employer and the employees can can agree on. Um, so uh, it could be the sort of thing that, um, and I'll just make up a, a hypothetical situation here, but you could be saying that, you know, it's, it's all snowplow drivers are going to form a union. And the employer says, yeah, that makes sense. Um, that bargaining unit makes sense to us. So, and I'm just pulling that out because there was a snowplow driver in an earlier example. So it's the first thing that popped into my head. Um, but, you know, so it, whatever it is, whether it's administrative workers, um, law enforcement workers and so forth, um, the parties could agree that yes, this is the appropriate bargaining unit. Uh, on the other hand, what could happen is that the union might say, uh, we think it should be snowplow drivers, garage workers, and city hall administrative staff. And the municipality might say, well, we think the snowplow drivers and the garage workers have one set of interests, but the administrative staff have a different set. And we think they should be in two different unions. Uh, and then it would be up to the labor board to determine by looking at things like commonality of interests and over fragmentation, which is when you get too many unions representing tiny fragments of the workplace um, and you kind of lose the benefits uh, in terms of efficiency and in, in negotiating the bargaining agreements um, and, and other factors that it considers. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but the, at that point, the board would kind of make the determination and there are times where um, sometimes it's just one or two employees that are in uh, where there's a conflict. And sometimes it's multiple groups and slowly the parties uh, will, you know, maybe negotiate and agree on a couple of them and the rest of the board will decide. Um, but it's, it's usually a process and it's almost always unique to the particular workplace that um, is having that discussion, uh, especially if it's not a monolithic workplace where it's just one type of worker, um, but you have multiple different types of job descriptions that might be uh, uh, looking at potentially unionizing. Representative Parsons, then Triano. Thank you. Um, I just had a question for Liz. Um, one thing that I've noticed, I'm a new member, and one of the things I've noticed that happens a lot, uh, so I'm going to start trying to break this down here, is we use, we can only legislate for Vermont. However, a lot of the times when uh, statistics are used, most always national, I'm finding out, is that's what gets used. Um, earlier, you had said that a third of groups that try to organize, there's a retaliation against. I was curious if that was a Vermont statistic or if that's a national statistic. That's a national statistic. I don't have statistics for Vermont. Um, it's really hard to get those statistics in the first place. But um, as I, I told you through the story and, and, and others, um, you know, it's not, there's nothing special about the public sector that makes them immune, uh, those workers immune to retaliation. Um, you know, it could be a softer glove, but the, the effect is the, the same at the end of the day. There's, there is an, a power imbalance. Okay. I think there are laws in place, right, for retaliation, Vermont, if I'm not correct? Right. As I stated um, in my testimony, um, there are unfair labor practices, but they have no teeth. Um, there's no fee uh, or penalty. So, um, you know, if somebody is retaliated against, um, you know, and if we're able to prove it was a result of their union support, which is very hard in an at-will state, um, then maybe we, you know, months and months later after this person's life has been totally upended, um, get them to, you know, be rehired at a workplace in which their, their supervisor is hostile toward them. You know, who really wants that anyway? And, um, you know, maybe with back pay. 
but there's no penalty. That's not a penalty, that's just restoring. Okay, that might be a good place to look. Um, another one that actually popped in my head is Representative Murphy was talking because I don't have any ex personal experience or really family experience with this subject. So um, the one thing that did kind of jump out to me was uh, the election process for us. Um, and one thing that uh, somebody who spoke earlier mentioned, um, what is on this car? Is it, a, I don't know if it's like a postcard. I don't know how it works. What, what, what it actually is on the card? Because I know for me, I got geez, multiple signatures from people who said, there's no way I'm voting for you, but everyone deserves a shot. Here you go. And they were, I, they were a signature on my paperwork. So I'm just curious what actually is on the card to make them know that by signing this, this is your vote, because it really seems like what we're doing here is saying there shouldn't be a vote. So I'm just curious what's on the card that makes it obvious that this is taking place of that vote. It's very obvious. I can share my union card with you if you're curious. Um, it's not like a petition with a long list where you kind of see maybe a line at the top. It's a, it is, I, it has a whole paragraph with the union logo all over it usually, and says, I, you know, agree to join or have, you know, this union represent me um, and deduct dues. D dues deduction would happen after they negotiated their first contract, by the way, um, not right away. Um, so it's, it's pretty, it's not a, you know, oh yeah, I, I maybe, you know, support this, like someone, you know, have a clickboard at, at the, you know, uh, um, farmers market or something, and uh, you know, if anyone else wants to talk about their union cards and what they look like, I, I welcome that from Tevin uh, Omar as well. Yeah, if we could, I'd really appreciate it if we get those sent to Ron so that all of us could have a look at those. It could be helpful. Thank you. Would it be okay if I just threw in a quick additional thought to what was saying? Yes. Um, I mean, I, I think just also to to the I. You had brought up Representative Parsons, like the comparison to the process that you all went through. And I think that you could probably appreciate um, how little incentive there is to deceive potential voters or, you know, particular like you all represent small towns, right? The workplaces we represent are even smaller, right? And so the idea that we would like misrepresent, like we have to work with these people every day. So, so I think like while technically perhaps there's, there's an opportunity to have some yeah, I mean, sure, people could always pressure each other in subtle ways, but like there's no there's no reason to and we reflect so badly, not just on me, but on the entire union in a way that I would think anybody who runs for public office could appreciate, so. Um, Omar, did you want to chime in on that issue? Yes, sir. I, I, I just wanted to say that the whole reason that a union even exists in a workplace is because there's something going on in that workplace. Um, like for instance, a union couldn't go, and I hear a lot of good things about this company, um, Hypertherm in New Hampshire. A union couldn't just go into Hypertherm and say, hey, by, by the way, I wanna organize all you guys. They're gonna look at them and be like, what are you talking about? We're good over here, everything's fine. So I just wanna remind everyone that the whole reason that unions even exist is because there's a problem in the workplace. And it just does no one, no good to try to deceive in any way, form or fashion. It's just, I mean, the only word I can say to that whole thing is just yuck. I mean, for me to go to my sisters and brothers and try to get them to do something that they don't want to do is just awful. And then here's another thing that I want to remind everyone about is that if your union is not representing you correctly, the people power is gone. It like, let's just say you want to go ahead and start doing an action somewhere or something like that, and you try to work people up to do something. The people are going to remember what you did in the past and that you didn't rep represent them correctly. So your union power goes away. So that's the thing that I want to let you guys know that, first of all, there's a, there's a problem in the workplace. That's the reason the union exists. And then the union has to keep doing its job. We the people have to keep doing our job in order for us to be of use to the workers, to us. So I, I just want to make sure that everyone knows about that. The only reason, and I tell managers this all the time, you want to get rid of the union, take care of your employees. You'll never hear from us ever. It's as simple as that. 
Thank you. Representative Triana. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Uh, so I've never been a member of a union. And in some ways, I guess I'm fortunate to have been able to make my way in the last 45 years of my work career and to make a good living for my family without having to been in a position to have to have um, wanted to join or been able to join a union. Um, I worked mostly administratively, um, so it wasn't an issue for me. But um, my father and brother, I won't go into the story completely again. My father and his brother taught at the same school. And, I, and in the 1950s, they were paid very, very little. And so, uh, you know, when they, they were very strong union members and it did have an impact on our family. That's what I grew up with. Not that I'd been a member of a union, uh, but that I grew up uh, experiencing um, this in my family. And, uh, you know, I, I listened to Wendy and I know Wendy and, uh, you know, I have a good deal of respect for her, but what I heard from her presentation was a whole lot of speculation and not a whole lot of facts. Um, and it was disappointing to me, and maybe we'll get some more information from whoever we uh, hear from again, but you know, to suggest that um, unions intimidate and coerce people into joining them, you know, I can't buy it. There was absolutely no uh, information to back that, uh, that uh, proposition up. Um, so I, kinda, I was kind of left flat by that. And uh, you know, workers are a little bit more savvy than they were 50 years ago or 60 or 70 or 80 years ago, um, you know, when, when they feel that they're not being um, well cared for by their employers, and they don't have time to take a, a bathroom break, and they don't get enough time to eat their lunch, they can't raise their families and buy a home. Uh, those are the folks that understand that something is not right in the workplace that something needs to happen in order to promote better working conditions, better living conditions for those individuals. I believe people are willing to work and work hard for the most part. Uh, but, you know, when, when they don't feel adequately cared for by their employer, then that productivity doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, it really benefits everyone for this. And we just experienced in this country, the wealthiest man in the entire country, block a labor union in his facility. And I believe it was Alabama. And I have, it, have a, a, a union, a, a bargaining unit voted down by people who many of them walked off the job subsequent to that because we were here, we're hearing that they don't have adequate bathroom breaks. They don't have uh, adequate um, time to eat their lunch, uh, and they're not well cared for by the richest man in this country. That is bizarre. That is absurd. That should not be happening to American workers, not at this point in time. So that's just a, a few comments. I, I, you know, my observations, and I hope we can hear back from UVM and, uh, with a little bit more substance to what they're trying to tell us. And I remember last year when they came in and spoke this exact same. Uh, piece last year when they when I was here uh, and they come in to uh, debate this bill or to uh, try and uh, cut this bill down. Now, I just don't buy it. You know, the nurses had to go on strike in U UVM Medical Center in order to get uh, decent wages and conditions to work. And, you know, we're not in sweatshops anymore. And Jimmy Hoffa is gone under the uh, end zone of the, of the giant stadium in, in New Jersey. So, you know, we're just at a different date and time. And I believe that unions uh, are necessary or uh, instrumental in, in protecting our, our American workers and our Vermont workers for the most part. Representative Murphy, then Walsh. Thank you, Chair Stevens. I don't know how relevant this is to the card check conversation, but I do want to um, say that, that Omar, I'm a retiree of the United States Postal Service. I, I, <laughs> I worked there almost 15 years and uh, it, it certainly did give me many opportunities. And I know um, much of the circumstances that benefited me were because of a very strong union, um, but I never joined. And I just had my own reasons for not feeling that was what I desired to do. And I do have to refute the, the conversation that unions don't pressure because I got some pretty ugly letters and, and I appreciate that that's, you know, the voice of, of 
a group that is trying to say, we need your help, we're, we're working for all, you need to be part of all, you're one of us. But it, they weren't written in a very nice way at times. Um, and, and it wasn't a lot, but, but there were points where I did receive communications, mails that, that um, as I said, were pressure. So, you know, I, I think that we're all human and there's humans on both sides of any of these contracts and negotiations. So we want to make sure we don't suggest that only one side can twist a few arms. Thank you. All right, Representative Walsh. Thank you, I finally found the mute button. Uh, I want to add a different perspective. I grew up in a union family and I was a union member myself. My dad was a sheet metal worker. And back in the 50s, I remember his going on strike for five cents an hour increase. Just imagine, of course, today there would be absolutely nothing, but five cents an hour back in the 50s meant something. And the strike lasted several months and we, the family existed because we had help from the union and, and they finally did get their five cents an hour. Uh, so I, I've got a couple of things I wanna say about that from that experience. I think it's extremely important that uh, workers be able to organize. Uh, like Representative Troiano, I find it incomprehensible. I should also add that I've also lived elsewhere. I lived in Germany uh, where the social services and everything are very different and where this sort of issue would not have come up because people were pretty well taken care of. But here in the United States where we seem not to want to take care of people, we don't want to give them decent health care, we don't want to give them decent pensions, and so on, that makes this issue far more important. It, I'm also reminded that a couple of years ago, I presented the, the bill on uh, creating better working conditions for pregnant employees. And it's incomprehensible to me why the legislature should even have to go there. Why should we have to legislate that a pregnant employee might need more frequent bathroom breaks or might need a stool to sit on if she's working at a cash register? You know, why? Why can't that just be worked out? Why can't people be reasonable? And so that's all the more reason why we need people to be able to organize and to be able to say, look, this is just wrong. And it's not just about pay. That's not everything and every, that's not the whole business of unions. Of course, it's important pay and benefits, but it's also the working conditions as an example for the pregnant employees. So I, I'm, I'm definitely in favor on whatever we can do to make the process cleaner and less coercive. And I certainly support this legislation. Thank you. Uh, Liz Medina, then, then Representative Hanko. Thank you. Um, I just wanna say Representative Barbara Murphy, I'm sorry you had that negative experience. At the same time, I do think it's really important to differentiate between peer pressure and actual coercion. There's a difference between somebody who has equal power in your workplace, your coworker, to you know, saying something that may not be so nice. Um, and then difference between a supervisor who can take your ability to provide for yourself, to house yourself, to feed yourself, to go to the doctor away from you. That's power. That's the power and difference. That's coercion. There's a real difference. Peer pressure is not the same as coercion. Thank you. Representative Hango. Thank you. Um, like Representative Waltz, I grew up in a union household um, and I was also a union member about 40 years ago. Um, I feel that this is a subject that we're getting very, very emotional about. 
most of what we deal with in this committee are emotional issues. And I feel like our emotions are getting in the way. This is not about us versus them. This is about whether we can write good legislation that helps our workers or not. And I truly believe in the legislative process. I believe that we can write laws so that workers have the right to work safely. And I feel that we need to remove the emotion out of this conversation, at least for today. It's been a long week. Um, I could tell stories that would make you cry about something that happened with my family that a union should have supported us. And at the time, the union was powerless. But really, um, I'm not gonna go there because I'm really not that interested in sharing personal stories. This is about the whole state of Vermont. This is not just about certain workers, in my opinion. So thank you for listening. And I hope that um, we can thank our witnesses for their powerful testimony and maybe move on to the rest of our business for today. Thank you. Um, and just to be clear, this affects, you know, the, the places, the public sector unions. So it's not quite everybody, um, but it is people who work in, um, in the areas, in the, in the unions that are on the statutes for us, um, which could be municipal workers. It could be state workers could be, um, there's very, there's very few pockets of, of places that are still non-unionized in the public sector, but there are some. And we're seeing that played out in the in the article that Damien um, mentioned earlier. Um, it's two twenty five. I want to. Um, I've got to go. I I would like to thank Liz Medina, Omar Fernandez, and and Tevia Kelman for coming in today and testifying, and Wendy Koenig earlier. Um, we'll be taking more testimony on this as time allows in the in the coming in the coming weeks. Um, but thank you for this. This is. Um, a good indication of of what the issues are and what the goals are of the legislation and 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 where we are with it right now so thank you all so much um tevia who are you sharing there i can't i can't leave without uh, saying hello to the baby this is ozzy he just woke up from a nap it's waving a spoon there you go all right, everybody, let's take a break and I will see you on Tuesday. Um, and Chip, do you have, Chip, do you have this under control? Or are you still, I can't hear you. I'm still here. All right, are you, how's your power situation? Are you gonna be able to run the meeting? Yeah, it hasn't flashed off in a while yet, so. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. So come back at two, 2.35 or whatever.